There was a mother that had become uh, very ill, and uh, even to the point that they were not sure that she was going to live. And so the doctor sent her home, and she was confined to the bed. Her eight-year-old daughter did not realize how sick her mother was until one day when the doctor came to visit. The doctor and her father went into her mother's room, and unbeknownst to them, she was standing outside of the door, and she overheard the doctor say to her mother, I need to be frank with you. The time is not too far off. Before the leaves fall from the trees this fall, you will most certainly die. Fall came and the leaves began to fall. And One morning the father came down and the daughter was not at the breakfast table where he expected her to be. He began to look for her. He went through the house and finally he walked into the family room and looked out the bay window and he saw his daughter and his heart was broken because she was in the front yard gathering up the leaves and had twine where she could sew them together and put them back on the leaves. You see, death has a way of getting our attention. This morning we're going to talk about a little girl, 12 year old, who died and her desperate father. He knew that she was going to die. This passage says in verse 23, as we will read it in just a few minutes, my little daughter lies at the point of death. He was desperate. Maybe some of you have had a child that's been ill. Maybe some of you that I don't know about has had a child that has passed away or a grandchild. And you know that feeling. You know that desperation. I can't imagine. But it's in those times of helplessness that we actually can fall into the arms of God and experience His presence in a way like no other. If you have your scriptures and would like to follow along this morning, we're in chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel. And I'm going to begin reading with verse 21. But I want you to know that I'm going to skip a passage in here. We will come back to that next week. So there is a story within the story, and that middle story will come next week. So just be prepared for that when I jump uh, the scripture here. So chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and on seeing him, fell to his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him, pressing in on him. Going down to verse 35, while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue's officials saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what had been spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. He allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and they saw a commotion of people loudly weeping and wailing. And he entered in, and he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began to laugh at him, but putting them out, all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions, and they entered into the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, To leave the coon, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. 
Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately, they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given to her to eat. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Now the passage tells us that Jesus went back across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. And if you remember, there's been three steps here. Two weeks ago, we preached about uh, Jesus going from Capernaum, the northwest corner, down to the southeast corner. And that is where he calmed the storm of the sea. He meets Legion, or the man who had a legion of demons, as Bill preached last week. And now they have asked him to leave. In fact, they uh, begged for him to leave their region because he had uh, sent their livelihood into 2,000 pigs that had run off into the cliff and drowned. Please leave, they said. We don't want you here. So Jesus now goes from the southeast corner back to Capernaum as this passage began. And as he arrives, there's a large crowd that is waiting for him. They, they are waiting for him to come back. They must have gotten news. Jesus is coming. Because you see, he had left a large crowd before he had left to go to the garrisons. And in that large, large crowd was a synagogue official named Jairus. And Jairus, Jairus came to Jesus, a desperate father whose daughter was ill. It was not easy for Jairus to come. Think about it. Jairus lived in Capernaum, and he was a part of the synagogue officials, the rulers. He would take care of getting worship ready. He would take care of the property. He was known by the scribes and Pharisees and the Sanhedrin that would come into that synagogue in Capernaum and preach and teach. And so Jairus would have had friends of the religious right there, and you know what? They were thinking of Jesus. They had very little to do with Jesus. To them, Jesus was blasphemous. Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God, which they just could not fathom. And so for Jairus to go and seek Jesus out, he was running the risk of having these Sanhedrin turn against him, his friends that would deny him and leave him. But this desperate father would rather lose his friends and save his beloved daughter. A desperate man became bold. But I want you to understand something this morning that, yes, in desperation that his daughter was on her dying bed, he went to seek out Jesus, but there was something else, not just driven by desperation, but he was drawn by trust. He was drawn by trust. You see, living in Capernaum, it would have been very uh, likely that uh, Jairus would have maybe been there when the, the roof was opened and the man, paralytic, was dropped down and Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. If he wasn't there, he would have heard about it. It would have been very likely that when demons were cast out, Jairus could have been there. It could have been likely when people brought those that were sick to Jesus in Capernaum that Jairus knew that this man had touched them and they had been healed. And so he was driven by trust because you see in that verse 23, he says, not only is my little daughter, and this is where you have this fatherly heart. She's 12 years old. She's actually old enough to become a bride. She's actually old enough to be considered a young woman at the time. But he refers to her, my little daughter is at the point of death. But he continues. He says, please, please come and lay your hands on her. And then the so that comes. So that she will get well and live. So that she will get well and live. 
He trusts that if Jesus is in the presence of his daughter, if Jesus is there, if he will lay his hands on his daughter, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. He trusts. He's not just desperate, but he trusts that Jesus can make a difference. But before Jesus can even respond, there is news. They come and they tell the sad news. Your daughter has died. They look at Jairus. Jairus and, and say, says to him, your daughter has died. Can you imagine the, the heart of Jairus? This announcement that it's too late. It must have stabbed him right in the heart as a father. This is a prominent official of the synagogue, and you see that we all know that sickness and death includes everyone. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. It doesn't matter how large your bank account is. It doesn't matter what statue you have, where you stand in society. You see, death comes regardless of your statue in society. But these that came to Jesus or came to Jairus and Jesus and, and looks at Jairus and says, the child has died, all hope was gone for them. They didn't think Jesus could make any difference. They didn't think that Jesus could do anything about death. Death was final, death was irreversible. In their mind, what in the world would be the remote chance that this man, this teacher called Jesus, could restore life. <clears throat> we know this because they say in verse 35, why trouble the teacher anymore? Why trouble the teacher any longer? Jesus' response is really the focus of the sermon this morning. In verse 36, Jesus responds after overhearing what the messenger had given. Your daughter has died. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And Jesus' response is this. <clears throat> Do not be afraid any longer. Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. Don't stop believing, Jairus. You came to me and you believed if I came with you and touched your daughter that I could make her whole again. I could heal her. I could make her live. Don't stop believing, Jairus. <clears throat> Just because you've heard this message, don't stop. Trust in me. Don't be afraid. I can make a difference. Jesus was not swayed by the gloom and doom of the messenger. Rather, he began to minister to this father who had come to him in faith. No doubt Jairus, when he heard the message, probably had abandoned some hope of his own, even though he had come in faith. The sorrow of his daughter, being told that she was now dead. Could he grasp hold of the original message that he gave Jesus? Please come, lay your hands on my daughter, <coughs> If you do, she'll be healed and live. Could he grasp that again? He clearly had faith to start with. And the story that we're going to look at next week has just happened. And so he has seen with his own eyes, if he had never seen firsthand the other miracles, he has seen a woman that was healed right before his eyes. The story in a story. And we'll get to that next week. So what about his faith? Jesus turns to him and says, don't stop believing. Don't stop believing, Jairus. We see here the example of a person that Jesus is asking to put faith in me. 
It's easy for us when we, we go through those valleys, when we go through sickness or illness or we lose a loved one, it's easy for us in, the, in those circumstances for our faith to get weak. The darkness somehow wants to overshadow the light of Christ. Have you ever been there? Have you been there when the darkness begins to overcome and maybe doubt sets in? Is God, are you here? Are you with me? You have promised to be with me in all things, in all times. Can we hear the Holy Spirit saying to us in those times, don't be afraid, stop, don't stop believing? Do we believe all things are possible with God? When Emma was little, and um, when the, her siblings were out of the house with us and she began to sleep in her room, um, we would go in and put her to bed and cut the light off and shut the door, you know, say the prayers and, you know, how do you go to sleep? And before I could get back to my uh, recliner, I would hear, Dad! Dad! And so you go back, run into the door and open the door. I'm afraid of the dark. Can you stay in here with me? No, I can't stand here with you, honey. I'm going to be in the living room. We're nearby. We're, oh, you're going to be fine. I won't let anything happen to you. <coughs> you cut the light off, shut the door. Dad, Dad! So this one time I went back, and um, I decided that I could fix this. Uh, little did I realize this fix lasted <laughs> for several years. I said, okay, honey, uh, instead of being down the hall, what we'll do is you can come and make a pallet in our room where we sleep. And you can go to sleep on this pallet, and we're going to be right here in the other room because we're, the living room is right, our bedroom is right off the living room, uh, family room. And so I said, nothing's going to happen to you. We're right through this door. You just go to sleep. And she went to sleep. She trusted that we, what I said was going to happen. We were closer to her than she was in her room. And she believed because she was in our room that she was protected. And I can tell you that went on for years. <laughs> it's hard to get her out of that pallet beside our bed back into her bed in the room, but eventually it happened. The point is, is that closeness of God to us. Faith drives out fear. I saw a sign this week in Moore County on the marquee of a church, and I thought it was very apropos to the sermon today, and it read, Faith is rest. Think about that. Faith is rest. You see, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, and we actually have that faith that is strong in the midst of any circumstance, we actually can find rest in our faith. This was what Jesus was trying to implore to the synagogue official, Jairus. The crowd probably wondered as Jesus said, come on, let's go, we're going to the house, whether Jesus was going to console the mother and the father as a time maybe that he was going to, to just uh, be with them because of their loss. Maybe that's what the crowd thought. Maybe that's even what some of the family thought. But Jesus is not going to console. He gets to the house and Mark tells us that there is loud wailing, there's loud uh, a commotion, turmoil going on, uh, crying out loud. And Jesus hears this noise that's going on and you have to realize at the time they would hire professional mourners to come in. And these mourners, as soon as they heard that someone died, would show up at your house and they would want you to pay them because the more, the louder it could be and the more wailing that went on and the louder it was, it was like, oh, look at us. We've lost this loved one. Pity us. We're going through this terrible time. Can you hear our wailers? Our wailers are louder than your wailers. It was like, come see what's going on at our house. The commotion was loud as the people gathered. And then against this backdrop, Jesus walks in and gives hope and assurance. How do we know that? Because of what the passage says. 
So Jesus walks in, and he doesn't begin to console the family, the friends, the whalers. What he says is, why are you making all this commotion? Why are you weeping? The child's not dead. She's just sleeping. Now, did Jesus really think that the girl had not died? No, he, he knew she had died. She knew, he knew that she had passed away, that her body was lifeless. But we know that in Scripture, to be asleep, as he mentioned with Lazarus, that he raised from the dead, he again mentions sleep here. The child is not dead. In other words, the child is not going to stay dead. Just natural sleep that follows an awakening. The child is going to live again. So in the face of mourning and sorrow, Jesus gives this word of hope, this truth. And this is a word of truth that we need to live into. A word of truth that we need to understand. When Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 reminds us that because of Jesus, because of his death, and resurrection that we too will live that this body this body perishable body will decay but one day we'll put on this glorified body but our spirit at the time of death Paul says absent from the body is to be with God and this the spirit goes to be with God at the time of death we have this hope in Jesus Christ of what he has done for us this is the hope that Jesus was trying to give his family and ultimately it will come to fruition. Paul reminds us that in our sorrows we have hope, this anticipation of seeing our loved ones again. Husbands will reunite and see their wives. Believing wives will see their husbands. Believing parents will see their believing children this is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. This is the hope that we see in Jesus as he raises Jairus' daughter. The people, though, they didn't see any hope. They didn't hear any hope. In fact, they began to laugh at him. They began to humiliate him. If you, if you look at the Greek text here, it means that there were repeated burst of laughter in a way of humiliating Jesus. I think she's just sleeping. How stupid is that, they would say. No. She's dead. And they laugh at Jesus' words. In fact, their laughter <coughs> confirms the fact that they believed, firmly confirmed, that she was dead. They're about to see what God is capable of doing when all else fails. When God is present, something wonderful happens. Hudson Taylor, a famous missionary to China, tells of the story when he was sailing to China for the first time. And he was on a, a sail a sailboat, a big ship, and he was part of... Um, with the crew that was sailing and in his memoirs he says he got to they got to a point where they were close to this island and the island had cannibals on it and the wind had died down and it had died down to such a point that they had to bring the sails down and so they were drifting by the current and they were getting close enough to see that on the shore were cannibals and so the captain came to Mr. Taylor's room and knocked on the door and said, uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, do you think you could pray to your God for some wind? <laughs> and Hudson Taylor told the captain, said, yes, I can do that under one stipulation. You have to go back up and raise the sails. And the captain said, I can't do that. It's dead calm out there. My crew will laugh their head off at me if I go up there and tell them to raise the sails when there's no wind. 
Hudson Taylor said, then I won't pray. A little while later, as the boat drifted closer to the shore, and you could see the cannibals on the, the shore, the captain came back and said, I'm raising the sails. Would you mind praying? And Hudson Taylor said, yes, I'll be glad to. Well, it wasn't long before there was another. Yes, who is it? It's the captain. What can I do for you? Are you still praying? Yes. Please stop. We've got so much wind that we can't hardly manage what's out there now. And so Hudson Taylor said he went up, and sure enough, the wind is blowing and the sails, and the ship is starting to sail away from the shore. They were within 100 yards of the cannibals that were looking for a great feast with the crew. Folks, the world will laugh at you, often laugh at you, because of the faith that you have in what Christ has done and will do for you. Don't be caught up in the laughter of the world. Don't stop believing. Put your faith in Christ. He is your hope. Jesus walks into the room with Peter, James, and John, the two parents, five of them with him, six total in the room, puts everybody else out. He goes inside, and the, the little girl is laying there lifeless. She has died. And he reaches over and he takes her by the hand and with compassion and love he says in Aramaic to leave the kum. And Mark even tells us what that means. Little girl, I say to you, arise. And she arose. She got up. She began to walk. She is fully healed. There is no time lapse here of her healing. She is fully restored at the word of Jesus Christ. She is made whole. Even to the point that those five in the room, it says, are astounded. They are amazed at what just happened. Can you imagine Jairus? Maybe his mind went back to Jairus, don't stop believing. Jesus has just raised his daughter from the dead. Give her something to eat, he says. She's hungry. Proof again, the girl is alive. A miracle by the Son of God. Don't stop believing, Jairus. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm present. I can do something. When we are dead in our sins, it is Jesus Christ that through faith, through His Word, gives us new life. When we're facing great problems in life, it is Jesus Christ who gives us hope in hopeless situations. It is through the power of faith and belief that we can face what this world and Satan would deal out to us. And I am not making light of situations. When we lose a loved one, when heartache comes, when we face the sicknesses and the ills of this world, it hurts. But the scripture reminds us that God is ever present. Don't be afraid, Jairus. Don't stop believing. One day Christ will set this world right side up and we won't have to worry about it. Those of us that have gone on will celebrate the, the gathering of the saints and those that are still here will be gathered and not one lamb will be lost that has come to faith in Jesus Christ. What a glorious day. Until that day, we have to put our faith in the one that can make the difference. The one who cares. The one who loves us. The one who put himself in our place on the cross. I want you to think about it for just a minute. What do you think Noah 
fault as people began to laugh at him. Make your ark. I'm going to send a flood. You know, it took a few days to build that ark. Day after day, Noah and his sons went to build. Can you imagine the ridicule? I can, I can see Noah thinking, don't stop believing, don't stop believing. I know what God told me. Don't stop believing. What about Abraham? Abraham took Isaac, and God said, take your son, your only son, and go sacrifice him for me. Don't stop believing, don't stop believing. God's got a purpose here. God's with me. Abraham took Isaac, his only son. He laid him on the altar, had a knife ready to kill his only son. Because of the faith he had in God. What about Elijah? Elijah was one against 450. 450 prophets of Baal gathered and Elijah said, Go ahead, pray to your God. You've got a bull there, I've got a bull here, we've got an altar, I've got an altar. You pray and see if God can come down, your God can come down and, and burn up your sacrifice. And they prayed all morning and nothing happened. And at noon it says that I, Elijah went to him, hey, maybe you're not praying hard enough, you need to pray some more. You know, your God, you haven't, he hasn't done anything. Elijah's sitting there and out comes his time. Elijah didn't pray all morning and all through the day. Elijah just said one prayer. In fact, Elijah said one sentence. And it rained fire down. And not only burned up that which he had poured water on three times, water was in the trenches, the wood was wet, it said it consumed even the stone of the altar, the power of God. You think he had faith? To make a challenge to Baal's prophets. What about Nehemiah? Can you imagine Nehemiah in 52 days believing that God was going to build the wall around Jerusalem? He had faith. What about Paul and Silas in Philippi? It says that they were dragged through the street to the magistrate, that they were stripped, they were beaten, they were put in stocks. And at midnight, they're singing praises to God. Could you do that? Do we, is our faith such that we have that kind of faith in the living God that we can stand beaten, condemned, ready to be put to death in stocks, and we can sing praises, sing hymns to God? Do we really believe that? You say, well, Marty, that's, that's Scripture. Those are the illustrations that God has given us. Wait a minute, folks. I'm serving the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Are you? This isn't a God that we compartmentalize and put in, in, in a drawer or sitting on a shelf. This is the same God. The same God that promised faith to them, to be with them, to, to help them in their time of need. is the same God that we serve. Don't stop believing he says, when trials come, when situations arise. My God was there in February of 1973 when I lost my mama. He was there, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In June of 2012, when my dad died, God was there. Was I in despair? Yes, but I felt God's presence. You say, well, we just don't see the miracles that we, we see in the Bible here. You know, I don't know that God's still doing those type things. I don't know if God still raises people from the dead. I can tell you he does. I can tell you he does. I've got a sister that's alive. She was dead for 17 minutes. 17 minutes her heart was not beating. And the EMS guys came and brought her back to life. Twice going to the ER, she coded. Her heart stopped. They brought her back to life. In the ER, she coded. The fourth time, she was dead. They brought her back to life. They put her on life support. The second day, the doctor came in and told my brother-in-law, take her off of life support. She is brain dead. She's not going to live. We had churches. We had people. We had family that were on their knees praying for my sister. That third day, she awoke. She was 45. Today, she's 67. God rose her from the dead. She was dead. 
17 minutes. Don't tell me God doesn't work today. God is present. Will that always happen? No. I was in the room just a few weeks, just a few days ago, where I saw Roseanne take her last breath. And we were praying the same thing that she would get through that surgery. But in that, you see, she had not stopped believing that morning. She expressed her faith in Jesus Christ no matter what happens in the next few hours. It's win win. Either I'm going to get through the surgery and it's going to be good, or I get to be with God. That's what Roseanne said. That's the faith. Don't stop believing. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, don't stop believing. The same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the same God that you and I believe in. And he is as capable today of doing every single thing that he says he'll do. Do you believe in that God? Is your faith such that you believe in that God? Don't stop believing, he says. Don't be afraid. I'm ever present with you, Jairus. And I'm going to do something that's going to amaze you. And in that amazement, we too will find Father, thank you that in this passage you remind us of your Son, the power that you sent in, in Jesus Christ incarnate, God incarnate, that he would raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. Father, you, you're the same God that we believe in today. There's, there's not multiple gods. There's, you are the same, and you call us to faithful discipleship, to believe. Don't stop believing in you. You hold us when we're weak. You come alongside of us as we journey. And when the end comes, as a believer, you are present. And usher us into your glory to reign with you forever. Precious is that. The world can't offer that. Thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ. May we never stop believing. We pray this in his name. Amen.